Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Welcome everyone to the second lecture of week four of Adams to Materials. Today we're going to continue with statistical mechanics as uh, we'll do throughout the week. And we're going to discuss uh, the canonical ensemble systems that are at constant temperature and we're going to arrive at a micros microscopic definition of temperature. Um, I hope uh, many of you uh, took on the challenge of last uh, lecture and you're looking for local landmarks and, and sending, uh, collecting pictures of famous scientists uh, around your area. Uh, so let's start with a quick summary of uh, lecture one. In lecture one we consider systems uh, that are isolated from the rest of the world. Uh, those are under NVE conditions. Uh, that's called the microcanonical ensemble. Okay, so microcanonical ensemble means constant energy ensemble. Uh, we started by saying that all states consistent with the total energy are equally likely, have equal probability. And then we derived uh, a definition, a connection between the microscopic world and thermodynamics. We derived, we arrived at the definition of entropy, which is Boltzmann constant K uh, times the log of the number of states. And the number of states is written here. It's a sum over all microstates of this delta function, okay? Uh, Dirac's delta that is zero whenever the argument is not zero, and it just is non zero only for the states uh, with energy E, okay? Um, so that's where we are now. Now, under most conditions, our, our systems that we're interested in will not be isolated from the rest of the world. So the system uh, is going to be in contact with a heat bath. It's going to be able to exchange energy with its surrounding. So here's our system now. Our, my material is this little piece. It's inside a much bigger uh, thing. Could be your lab, your room. Uh, that's the heat bath. And the sum of system plus heat bath is isolated. Okay, so the energy E the energy of your system plus the energy of the bath is the total energy that's constant. Okay. So now we're going to ask ourselves, what is the probability of my system, my, my, my system uh, of interest, be in a microscopic state R sub i and P sub i? So what is the probability of the system being in a specific microscopic state? What I know from the previous lecture is that the whole thing, system plus path, is isolated. It's in the microcanonical ensemble. So all microscopic systems of the whole combined thing are equally likely. So the probability of the system being on a specific state of a set of positions R sub i and set of momentum P sub i is going to be proportional to the number of states of the bath, of microscopic states of the bath, which have energy, total energy, minus the energy of my system in that specific configuration. Okay, so once I fix all the positions and momentum of my system, that determines their energy. That's the expression H that you see there. And so that leaves E dot minus the energy of the system for the heat bath, and then omega of that energy, omega of the bath of that energy, is going to be the number of microscopic states of the heat bath consistent with my choice of microscopic state for my system. Okay, so the probability is that over the total omega, okay, the total omega is the total number of states of the combined system uh, bath plus the system of interest, okay? So I'm just applying the equal a priori probability postulate 
to find out the microscopic probability of my, of my system. Now, we said that the heat bath is very, very big, okay? So this, uh, compared to the system of interest. So this omega of the bath here, E dot minus H, H is very small compared to E dot, okay? So what I'm going to do is expand the log of omega of the heat bath uh, around E dot, okay, because I'm uh, evaluating it very, very close to E dot. Okay, so, so let's do that. Log of the microscopic, of the, prob the microscopic probability um, is the log of the heat bath evaluated at E dot minus the, the log, the derivative of the log of the heat bath with respect to energy E times the delta energy. The delta energy is the energy of my system, and I'm going to call that E. So this is H of R sub E P sub I. Okay? Now, we know that the log, the derivative of the log of the number of states with respect to energy is uh, 1 over kT, it's beta, right? So remember from last class, beta 1 over kT. So uh, that's what I have. So now I have a relationship between the log of the microscopic probability of my system and its energy, okay? So if I invert the log, what I get is the microscopic probability or the probability of finding my system in a microscopic state given by R sub i, P sub i is proportional to E to the negative beta, 1 over kT, times the energy of that state. Okay, and that's both the ba Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. Okay, so from starting from the microcanonical ensemble and the probability of uh, equal the equal probability postulate, we can derive that a system uh, under in contact with a heat bath will have this Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, uh, where the probability of a microscopic state is proportional to e to the negative beta, the energy of that microscopic state. Uh, what you see there in the de in the denominator is simply a normalization function. Okay, if this is a probability, I know that if I sum a probability over all possible states, I need to get one. I need to get certainty. So the no the denominator is simply a normalization factor that guarantees that if I, uh, as I just said, if I sum the microscopic probability over all possible states, I get one, okay? All right, excellent. So that's where we are. We derived the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Uh, this denominator, the normalization function, uh, is very useful, and it has a name. It's called partition function, okay? And typically it's called Z. So Z, the partition function, is a function of the number of atoms, the volume, and temperature, and it's a sum over all microscopic possible states of the Maxwell-Boltzmann weight, e to the negative beta, the energy of that specific state. The temperature comes from that beta, okay? So if the temperature is different, beta, the beta that I'm using, will be different, okay? So, great. Uh, what we're going to do now, what we're missing is a connection between these microscopic probabilities and the macroscopic world, okay? So we want, like in the canonical, in the microcanonical ensemble, we want a connection to uh, a free energy or entropy or something like that. So let's look at this partition function in a little bit of detail. The partition function is a sum over all possible microscopic states of e to the negative beta, the energy of that state. 
Now, of course, I'm going to have lots of states with the same energy. Okay, um, all those states with the same energy will contribute the same value to this sum. Okay, to the um, partition function sum, and so and that number, the number of states, is was defined before as omega. Okay, omega of n v e, and so the partition function can be written as a sum over energies or an integral over energies of the number of states with that energy times the Maxwell Boltzmann weight. Okay, so these two things are equivalent. Okay, except that instead of summing over all microscopic states, I first group the states by energy, states by energy, and I sum over energies. And I have this multiplicative constant that tells me how many states I have with that energy. Okay, that sounds great. Now, the integrand here, the this product is the probability of finding the energy, uh, the finding the system with energy E. Okay, it's the number of states with energy E times the probability of finding the system in a microscopic state with energy E. Okay, So the product of those two quantities is the probability of finding the state in energy E, regardless of what microscopic state uh, it is. So let's look at this quantity, Okay, I, this probability of finding my system at energy E. It's the product of two quantities. It's the product of an exponential that that's the Maxwell-Boltzmann weight, and what that tells me is that high energy states are less probable. Ma microscopic state with high energy is less probable than lower energy states, fine. Uh, but it's multiplied by this omega function, which is the number of states as a function of their energy. And this function, for most systems, uh, grows very, very fast with the number of energies. Uh, remember in the previous lecture our example of a 1D harmonic oscillator, we said that the ellipse in which it moved grew bigger and bigger and bigger as the energy went up. So if I have more energy, I have more states available. Just think about momentum, right? So if I have more kinetic energy, I have more possible ways in which my momentum can be distributed. So that function grows very quickly. The product of these two things, the exponential that's going down, the number of states that's going up, it's a function that has is very peaked. Okay, it has a peak, very narrow function around the equilibrium value of the energy. Okay, and again, we all know from experience that microscopic objects, uh, the fluctuations are not very big. Okay, if I look at I calculate the energy of this pencil, of course it's exchanging energy with the environment, so its energy is not always the same, but the fluctuations are very, very minimal. And so uh, we know that this, this quantity here will not fluctuate too much. So uh, out of this sum over energies, um, there's one term that's going to dominate, and that's the term with the average energy. Okay, so I can approximate this the sum over all possible energies, there's one term that's going to dominate, and that's the, the term with the average energy. Okay. And so, um, so I can simplify my partition function. There's one term that's going to dominate. And so now if I take the log of the partition function, uh, what I have on the uh, right-hand side is log of omega. Okay. This is S over K, and then minus E over KT, okay? So you can now recognize that we can build a free energy out of this, okay? So energy minus TS, energy, internal energy, minus temperature times entropy is the Helmholtz free energy. And uh, you can see here that the Helmholtz free energy is negative kT times the log of the partition function. And again, if you remember, the partition function over here has a microscopic definition. So again, 
what I found is that there is a connection between the microscopic world and a free energy uh, that I can do thermodynamics with. So that connection between the microscopic world and thermodynamics is also there in the uh, canonical ensemble. Again, canonical ensemble where my system is in touch uh, with the heat path. Now, uh, let's think about uh, how we can use this information. How can I use this knowledge of the probabilities um, of, the un of, the, of the possible states? So let's say I want to compute an average with, within the canonical distribution. Let's say I have any quantity that depends. I can write in microscopically. I can write it in terms of positions and momentum. Okay, Maybe it's pressure. Um, uh, could be any uh, thermodynamic quantity that you're interested in. So the average value of this quantity, uh, and we're going to use as before these pointy brackets for averages, is a sum over all possible states of the value of that quantity in that state times the microscopic probability of that particular state. So uh, spelling it out, it's a sum over all possible states of the quantity that I want, that I'm interested in, times the Maxwell-Boltzmann weight. And remember here in the denominator, that's just the normalization of the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Uh, so those type of uh, averages are called ensemble averages. Okay, I'm averaging using the probabilities of finding the system in a specific state. Now, when we do simulations, uh, molecular dynamic simulations, or when we go to the lab and make a measurement, let's say I put a, th a, a thermocouple and I measure temperature, or I, pressure, uh, I measure pressure, what I measure is a time average. Okay? The, the, the physical process of making a measurement uh, it involves a, a necessarily a time average. And so, in, in, in molecular dynamic simulations, we do the same thing. You've already run some MD simulations. You can look at the average uh, internal energy, for example, of a system and report that internal energy. Those are time averages. Uh, what we're saying here is that under equilibrium conditions, ensemble averages and uh, from using statistical mechanics and time averages are the same thing. Okay. Uh, what we're saying is that uh, the, the, the probability that I get in the ensemble is equivalent to the probability that I get the, to, to the states, the probability in which they show up uh, in the natural temporal evolution of the system. Okay, um, And that's how we're going to use uh, connect thermodynamics with uh, molecular dynamics simulations. Uh, just to sum up a little bit, we talked about two ensembles, the microcanonical NVE ensemble and also the canonical ensemble where energy is not constant and uh, T, temperature, is maintained by heat path. And uh, we're going to discuss now, uh, an, uh, not discuss, but introduce another constant, uh, another important ensemble that, that's called isobaric isothermal. So NPT, so now volume is not constant and pressure is constant. So in all of these cases, uh, we have a, a probability distribution functions, okay? The probability of a microscopic state, Maxwell Boltzmann. And here for the isothermal isobaric ensemble, it's very similar, but I have an extra PV term there. In all of them, there's a partition function that involves summing over microscopic states. Okay, and that gives you the relationship between uh, microscopic states and probabilities. And in all of this, there's a connection to a free energy. Okay, uh, entropy, uh, Helmholtz free energy, and a, a, another free energy in the uh, NPT uh, under NPT conditions. Okay, that's the Gibbs free energy. Uh, so in all of these cases, again, very similar structure 
connecting the microscopic world to, to the macroscopic world. So we're going to finish the lecture uh, applying the canonical ensemble uh, and deriving a principle called equipartition of energy. And what we're going to do is I'm going to try to I'm going to compute an average of a quantity. Okay, um, so and the quantity that I'm going to compute is a quantity that appears in the Hamiltonian. So uh, let's look at the Hamiltonian uh, of, a, of a general system. Uh, we know that the kinetic energy is a sum of p squared uh, over 2m, sum over all degrees of freedom. And then I have a potential energy. Uh, I apologize, this should have been a capital R. So I have potential energy. And then I have the kinetic energy term that I'm going to break up into two pieces. One piece over here, the second piece is summing, starting at the second variable. And I'm going to single out one of the momentum in the system. And I'm going to compute the average contribution of this variable to the energy. Okay, So I'm going to write my Hamiltonian as lambda times p1 squared plus h prime. And h prime is the Hamiltonian, the remaining part of the Hamiltonian that does not contain p1. Okay, I singled out one variable. And what I'm going to compute is the average value of this piece of the Hamiltonian, okay? How much this variable, uh, P1 squared, contributes to the total energy in average, okay? And of course it's over 2m, I'm going to just call lambda because it's generally applicable, okay? So I have a prefactor here, lambda, okay? I'm going to use the definition of ensemble average that we saw before. I sum over all r's and all p's of uh, the quantity that I want to average, lambda times p1 squared. And uh, I have the Maxwell-Boltzmann weight, e to the power negative energy over kT. And then, of course, at the bottom I have the normalization function. Okay, Now, because the Hamiltonian is additive, I can uh, factor out the components, and I can uh, integrate out all the components, all the all the variables except for p1. Okay, so uh, these integrals become the product of uh, different integrals. The first one involves all the variables except p1. And uh, I think uh, p, or the integral involving p1 is separate. And I'm going to do the same thing in the denominator where I have the partition function. So I'm going to break the integral of the partition function as a product. The first part is all variables except p1, and the second piece is p1. Okay. And again, I can do this because the Hamiltonian is additive. And so the exponential becomes a product of exponentials. Uh, the first two integrals in the numerator and in the denominator are, of course, the same, and they go away. And I'm left with the integral that you see, a ratio of two integrals that you see there. I'm going to do a simple change of variable, okay, just to simplify the integral a little bit. and. Uh, I can solve this analytically. And what I find is that the average contribution of this variable, the average of lambda p1 squared, is one half kT. Okay. Now, of course, this result doesn't depend on the fact that it, that it's p1. Okay. Any any momenta could have uh, I could have used any of the momenta. I could have used any variable that appears squared in the Hamiltonian. And very interestingly, the lambda, the prefactor, does not appear. So regardless of what lambda is, this variable will contribute one half of kT to the energy. 
So this is called the principle of equipartition of energy. Any variable that appears squared in the Hamiltonian contributes one half of kT to the total energy. Okay, uh, this is very important. For example, if I have a material with heavy atoms and light atoms, okay, so the lambda would be different. The prefactor would be different. What this tells me is that the average kinetic energy of each one of these atoms in thermal equilibrium is the same. Whether I have a heavy atom or a light atom, in average they will contribute one half of kT of kinetic energy per degree of freedom. If I live in three dimensions, every atom will have a kinetic energy that's three halves of kT. Okay? So the average, the average kinetic energy of any system in equilibrium, regardless of what the masses are, is 3 halves times n kT, okay? Each variable contributes 1 half kT. I have 3n momenta, px, py, pz, for every one of my systems, okay? Now this is very important because the, kin the average kinetic energy is something that I can calculate from an MD simulation, right? In MD I know my positions and I know my velocities as a function of time. I can do a time average of the kinetic energy and with this relationship convert that into temperature, okay? So extremely important result and again uh, this was one of our goals, right, that we set for the week is if I'm doing a molecular dynamic simulations, MD simulation how can I compute temperature or any other thermodynamic property? Now, uh, so this is this is very good and this is correct. Now, in many cases, if, if I have my pencil, if the whole pencil is moving with a constant center of mass velocity, it, it, that doesn't contribute to temperature. Okay, so collective motion doesn't contribute to temperature. That's a, a constant of motion of the system. So when we do molecular dynamic simulations, often we zero the center of mass velocity of the system, okay? So really, I don't have uh, 3n degrees of freedom. I have 3n minus 3 because the center of mass of the system is fixed in space. So 3n minus 3 halves kT is average kinetic energy. Uh, when you're dealing with molecules, with non-periodic systems, we often uh, make the um, angular momentum zero. You can remember in the cluster simulation that I showed you earlier, the angular momentum was not made to zero and the cluster was oscillating. If I make the angular momentum zero, there's another set of three degrees of freedom that are have to do with the three Euler angles. They're also zero and they don't contribute to the kinetic energy. Uh, so in general the relationship between temperature and kinetic energy um, is that the, uh, the kinetic energy is three halves times the number of effective degrees of freedom uh, times kT. Okay, and. Uh, in strictly speaking, it's only the average kinetic energy that's related to the thermodynamic temperature, okay? Now, in MD simulations, we often abuse a little bit this relationship and we uh, report an instantaneous temperature. And so in a temperature at a given instant in time by relating, uh, by computing the instantaneous kinetic energy, and just converting it in this way to instantaneous temperature. That's okay to, 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 uh, to, to be done. It's very useful uh, in many cases, but one needs to be very aware that thermodynamic temperature is the long-term, long-time average of kinetic energy and not the instantaneous value. The kinetic energy is oscillating in time. Uh, the temperature is not oscillating in time. Temperature is the long-time long time average of that quantity. So that's all I had for uh, the second lecture. Um, I'll see you in lecture three. Thank you very much.